right, moving on now to section, um, or module, I should say, five, section four, or investigation four, quadratic functions and completing the square to find the maximum and vertex of a parabola. So quadratic functions are all functions that are in the form ax squared plus bx plus c. The two right here is an indication that this is a parabola. So we're going to talk in uh, this chapter a lot about quadratic functions and how they behave, how you could just look at an equation and know a little bit about what's happening with it. And then we will always need to be able to find the vertex of it. So here is a parabola that opens up. Here's a parabola that opens down. These guys right here, the lowest point or the highest point, these are known as their vertexes or their vertices, I guess we could say, since we're talking about multiple. But that's where the completing the square to find the max, min, and vertex of a parabola then comes in for the second half of the lesson. All right, so first of all, we go back to a skill that we talked about back in the gateway section about can you factor, all right? Like you need to at this point be able to look at these and factor them. Like factors of 48 are 6 times 8, and if you add those, it gives you 14. If you need it to be negative 14, you'd use a negative 6 and a negative 8. So this here factors into x minus 6 and x minus 8. So again, that was something from earlier um, in, in this year. Like this one here, factors of 21 are 7 and 3. I need x minus 7, x plus 3 in order to get the negative 4 that's in the middle. You know, those are skills, again, that you should have already before even starting this lesson. That's why the gateway test and, um, you know, retest and retest again was so important earlier this semester. But now we're going to take those same types of problems and change the directions and say, can you also give the zeros, roots, or x-intercepts? So these are parabolas. And these values that you find when you factor them are where they actually cross the x-axis when you graph them. So usually the only thing we add to this is putting an equal zero at the end. If you have two things that multiply to give you zero, it means either the first one equals zero or the second one equals zero. So if you set the first one, I'm going down to the bottom here, if you set the first one equal to zero and you set the second one equal to zero, then to work to get x by itself, you'd add six to both sides. Here you'd add eight to both sides. And you actually start noticing, hey, these are the opposite sign as what you had up here which means you don't have to show that work. You could just say, all right, x equals 6 and 8. So for this one here, it would be x equals opposite of negative 7 is positive 7, opposite of positive 3 is negative 3. These are the places that these here actually cross the x-axis. So just to make sure that you believe me, I will take and graph that first one there. I'm going to go to y equals, clear out any of this that I have in there and type in x squared minus 14x, and then plus 48. And when I go to graphing this, I'm not going to see the entire parabola. I am see a good chunk of it, but it does continue to go up forever and ever. But you see how this crosses the x-axis axis actually at 6 and at 8. So that's what factoring in the long run then does for you. It gives you something that then you are able to take and identify on a graph. So that's when we talk about um, those that have a coefficient of 1 where these are just x's. But now let's talk about some others. Let's look at number 6 right there. 4x squared minus 4x minus 48. It's not a bad idea if they all have a number in common to first factor it out. Because then what that does for you is it leaves it as smaller numbers that are easier for you to factor. Factors of 12, 1 times 12, 2 times 6, 3 times 4. Which one, if I add or subtract it, does it give me negative 1? And if I have a positive 3 and a negative 4, plus 3 minus 4, they multiply to give me the 12. Now what if I set it equal to 0? Well, the number out front means nothing. If, you know, 4 does not equal 0. We cannot use that piece at all. However, if it was a 4x, 
equal zero, then x would be zero. So you could have some situations like that as well. For this one, x equals negative three and x equals four. So this happens to be a parabola that crosses the x-axis at negative three and four. What about others that we might see? Um, let's take a look at uh, number eight. Number eight says three x squared plus 20 x minus 63. I do not have a common factor for all three of these terms, so I can't factor a three out or anything. That means when I go to factor, I'm going to have a three x and an x right here. And you might remember when we did this before, we multiplied the first and last term together and figured out which of those factors could we take in order to fill these spots right here, you know, what factors of 63 could I use in order to get a 20? So when I do that, 3 times 63 is 189. 3 times negative 63 is negative 189. I look for factors of that that will end up giving me 20. So what about like negative 9 times Oh, if I, that goes in there, 21 times. Well, that does not add to give me 20. So what about um, negative 7 times 27? Does that, looks like that multiplies to give me, I'm just checking that, I don't think it's 27. 189 divided by 7 here, my brain isn't working. 189 divided by 20, or divided by 7, is, it was just 27, I was right, all right, I didn't have faith in my work right there, negative 7 times 27, now if I add these two numbers, it does give me 20, so between these and these, I need to have a 27 and a negative 7, well, here's the negative 7, 9 times, or 3 times negative 9 or positive 9 gives me 27, so there I have those two values. Now what about when I set it equal to zero? Well, this one's easy. X equals negative nine. But this one is not as easy, okay? If you took three X minus seven equal to zero on this problem right here, added seven to both sides, and divided by three, X is seven thirds. Notice it's the opposite of that number, just like before, but then you have to divide by the number that's in the front. So that would be the shortcut of it. So in other words, let's say you have a problem, whatever the number happens to be, and you have 2x minus 3 and 5x plus 1 equals 0. This one is going to be the opposite of this, which is 3, divided by this number, 2. So that's one of your answers. Do it the same here, opposite of this divided by this. That gives you the other answer. Or you could do all of this workout for each one of them. Okay, you have the option. It's totally up to you. So that is where these here happen to come from. Um, let's talk about number 12 real quick as well, um, just because I think that one is good in a couple of different ways. All right, let's see if I can squeeze it in right here. All right, it looks like all of those terms have a 3 in common and also an x. So if I factor a 3x out, I get a 4x squared minus um, 9x and minus 9 right there. So that means now this here I'm left to factor. Since these are perfect squares here and here, I like to start with 2x, 2x, uh, 3 and 3 and see if those give me the number that's here, which in this case, they don't actually give me that number. So, okay, I, I can't use that, which means it's not going to be the 2x and the 2x probably, unless I have 2x, 2x, and then I have 9 for one and one for the other. That gives me 18 and 2. Well, that does not give me a 9. All right, so that means I have to back it up. And sometimes factoring is like this, where you try one thing and it doesn't work, so you try something else. So what if you try the 4x and the x instead of 2x and 2x? From here, I could use a 3 and a 3. This is 12 and 3. If I had it negative 12 and positive 3, then I would get the negative 9 that I have there. All right, so now when I set this equal to 0, this is the easy one, x is 3. 
this one a little bit harder. X is opposite of the, that second number over the first number. And this one here, if you get 3x equals 0, divide by 3, x is 0. So for this one, because it is a cube right there, you would get three answers. But remember, we are talking about, in this section here, quadratics, so we are going to focus mostly on that. All right, so moving on. A quadratic equation is, is an equation that can be written in this form. Notice the equal 0 that's all of a sudden appearing there where a, b, and c are all real numbers, and a cannot be zero. Some important properties to remember are the quadratic formula. The solutions of ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, where a is not zero, could be found this way as well. So for those of you that are not good at factoring, you might have to use this method to help you. All right, and you might, you know, I, I know with us going online, you know, you're going to have this formula in front of you at all times, but I will tell you, for those of you that have to move on to calculus, you need to make sure you're studying differently and understanding you need to know that formula. And so, I'm going to sing a little song for you. I'm sorry, I am not a singer in any way, but here's a little tune that can, you can kind of put in your head to remember this, so that when you don't have the formula in front of you. It's to the tune of Pop Goes the Weasel. And it goes like this. X equals opposite of B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And so again, that is just very helpful in how you can remember that formula. So you can sing it to yourself over and over again and then you'll have it. It would make doing your homework much faster. It would also make taking your test much faster for you. Remember, those are timed, so if you run out of time, too bad. All the rest that you haven't answered are wrong. It means you didn't study enough for the test. Now, what I want to do is I want to go back to one of these problems that we did on the last slide and pull it over here and show you how you can get the same numbers. So let's pull like that first, well, those are big numbers. Let's pull uh, the second one, x squared minus 4x minus 21, okay? x squared minus 4x minus 21 equals 0. We're going to put the equal 0 on. I just want to make sure I have the signs correct. In this problem right here, a happens to be 1, b happens to be negative 4, and c is negative 21. So I'm just taking the coefficients for each of those letters. Then to plug it into this formula, this means the opposite of b. If b is negative 4, then I'm going to take positive 4. If it's positive, then I'm going to make it negative. Plus or minus the square root. Now I need to square b. Negative 4 times negative 4 is positive 16. And then we have minus 4 times a times c, which is negative 21, all divided by 2 times a, which is 2. So quite honestly, all of you should have seen this when you took Algebra 1. This really is not new for you. This should be review. From here, I am going to take and I need to simplify what's under the square root. This means six plus, or 16 plus, and then I multiply these together and I get 84. 16 plus 84 happens to be 100. All right, then from there, the square root of 100 is 10. So that means your first x value is 4 plus 10 over 2, and your second x value is 4 minus 10 over 2. 4 plus 10 over 2 is 14 over 2, which is 7. That is your first answer, or one of your answers. It doesn't really matter the order you have these. Your second one is negative 6 over 2, which is negative 3. If we go back to the slide before and look at our answers, our answers were 7 and negative 3, exactly the same answers. But look at how much work we did here, and look at how much work we did here. So here's what I'm saying. It's going to save you time to know how to factor. If you don't know how to factor, it's not the end of the world. It's just that you've got to be able to use quadratic formula fast in order to get through the problems quickly. All right, sometimes the quadratic does not factor, in which case you have to use the quadratic formula. So here are some problems right here where it looks like they factor, but they don't. All right, so for number one, 
it does not factor. A is 6, B is negative 5, and C is negative 4. I like to write these over to the side because sometimes when I glance at the equation, I tend to leave the negatives off, and so I don't want to make that mistake when I go to complete one of these problems. So here we have x equals up as at a b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. It's kind of hard to keep up at that pace, but <laughs> there they are. Um, from here, I always tend to pull these guys down first, and then I go and worry about the square root. Um, so this here is 25, and then here I multiply these. Um, when I do, I think I get, let's say, 24 times 4 would be 96, and the two negatives make a positive. When I add those together right there, I end up getting um, 121. The square root of 121, I was just checking to make sure I did that right, is 11. So 5 plus or minus 11 over 12. When your answers come out this nice, it means the problem actually did factor. But sometimes the numbers are such that we have a difficult time finding how they factor. So here we have 5 plus 11 over 12, and then we have 5 minus 11 over 12. This is 16 over 12, which of course 4 goes into the top number 4 times and in the bottom number 3 times. Then for this one, we have negative 6 over 12, which happens to be negative 1 half. Um, so there are our two answers for that. So this one would have factored. Um, I just took for granted for what that said right there, and I guess it um, actually did factor. The second one, though, does not factor. So number two, A is 1, B is 3, C is negative 2. How I know that this one over here factored was because I didn't have a square root left in the problem. If it doesn't factor, there is a square root left. So let me show you with this one. X equals opposite of B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So we have negative 3 plus or minus. This is the square root of 9 plus 8, which is 17. We do not know what the square root of 17 is. And for that reason, we would say negative 3 plus the square root of 17 all over 2 is our first answer. And negative 3 minus the square root of 17 all over 2 is our second answer. All right, so if, if iMathAz is looking for exact answers, this is what they are looking for. However, sometimes they'll say, give your answer to the nearest tenth, hundredth, thousandth, whatever. So let's say it said, give your answer to the nearest tenth. What you would have to do to put it in your calculator, for those of you with this calculator, you're going to press alpha y equals and put it in exactly as you see it. The negative 3 and the plus square root of 17 are all on the top. And then on the bottom is a 2. You get 0.56 for that first one if that's what the directions ask. If they don't ask for that, they're going to mark it wrong. So you got to watch your instructions. To type it in again, you can do the same thing, or you can press second and then enter, and it brings it back. You can just use your back and up arrow keys and move over to the plus sign and change it to a minus sign. Sometimes it's just as easy, though, to type it in again. Negative 3.56. X equals negative 3.56. Okay, now, those of you that do not have this particular calculator, you cannot say negative 3 plus the square root of 17 divided by 2. Whoops, sorry, let me get that out of there. Delete, 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 delete. Back up the truck. Let me get out of there. Divided by 2 and expect to get the correct answer. Notice you get a different answer, okay? If you do not have that fraction key on your calculator, you have to press the parentheses, then put what the numerator would be in the parentheses. Then close it. Then put divide by 2. So you have to do yours a little bit different. Or do the numerator, press enter, and then divide by 2. That happens to work as well. 
Okay. So what about some of these problems like number six or number seven or number eight where they're not really in the correct format? All right. So let's talk about this. For number six, you would actually have to take and distribute the negative 2x to each of those and then move the 6 over. So negative 2x, I'm going to pull it down here and then I'll move this. Negative 2x times x plus 4 equals negative 6. While I'm at it, I'm going to write number 7. 7x squared minus 3x equals negative 6. And then number 8, x squared plus 16 equals 8x. All of these kind of fall into the same category and that it has to equal zero before you can take and use the quadratic formula. You can't have extra parentheses in there and it has to be in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So this is minus 2x squared minus 8x equals negative 6. Add the 6 to both sides. Negative 2x squared minus 8x plus 6 equals zero. Then you're ready to roll. A is negative 2, B is negative 8, C is 6. I don't think you need to see 20 of these in order to get them. Again, quadratic formula is review truly for you. For this one here, you would just need to add 6 to each side to make sure that you have it equal to 0. Now you're ready to roll. A is 7, B is negative 3, C is positive 6. Make sure when you move it to the other side that you change the sign. That is a common mistake. For this one here, I subtract 8x. you got to make sure that he falls in order where he belongs right in there. you got to make sure that it goes x squared, then x, then the number. Then you're ready to roll. A is 1, B is negative 8, C is 16. And then from there, again, you will be using your calculator to help you square things and such. All right, I need to pause for just a second. Okay, moving on now to some other types of problems with quadratic functions. During the annual frog jumping contest at the county fair, the height of a frog jumps in, jump, frogs jump in feet is given by negative one-third x squared plus four-thirds x. What is the maximum height reached by the frog? All right, so with this right here, I can show you a couple of things. The first one is, what if I factor this? All right, what can I factor out? Well, they both have thirds. They both have x's. So what if I take and factor out a negative one-third x right here? When I do, if I take the first term divided by negative one-third x, I get x. And if I take the second one divided by negative one-third, I get negative four. Because if I multiply that back out and distribute that, I would get four-thirds x. When I set it equal to zero, well, when the first one equals zero, it says x equals zero. When the second one equals zero, it's x equals four. All right, so what does this mean right here? It means that this parabola crosses the x-axis at zero, and it crosses the x-axis at four. Now, some other things that I need to start pointing out. If your squared term, ax squared, if a is negative, then that means the parabola opens down. If A is positive, then that means the parabola opens up. So I know for this right here that this parabola is going to open down. In fact, it's going to look something like this. But this question is asking, what's the maximum height? How high is it right here? Now, notice I drew this so that that maximum height happens to be right in the middle of the two x-intercepts. That means that it has an x value of 2. But the height itself is actually what's the y value. So one thing I could do is I could take and I could go back to the original equation and I could plug a 2 in. I could find what f of 2 is. I get negative 1 third times 2 squared, 2 squared is 4, plus 4 thirds times 2, which gives me negative 4 thirds plus 8 thirds, which happens to be 4 thirds. Four thirds is the same thing as one and one third or 1.3 repeating. So the maximum height reached by the frog, the frog, <laughs> I can't talk, the frog is 1.3 feet or one and one third feet. 1.3 really isn't enough unless you have the bar over the top. Okay, so that's one way you could do it. Another way you could approach this problem as well is on your calculator. 
you could go to your y equals, clear that out, and you could type this in. Now, because it does have fractions, and to make sure I type them in correctly, uh, in the calculator correctly, that is not incorrectly, but I'm going to use my fraction key. Here's negative 1 over 3, and then next to it I'm going to put my x squared. After that I have plus, and then I'm going to take and use my fraction key again, and put 4 on top, 3 on the bottom, and x beside it. I can go in and I can graph this one as well. I'm going to see the same parabola there. It's crossing at 0 and 4. And then from there I can find the maximum height. How I do this is I press second calculate. At this point so far we have done intersect number 5. But you see number 4 says maximum. If I press the number 4, then it asks me some questions at the bottom. It says, what is the on the left? Pick a number to the left of the maximum, which right now it's there. So I'm going to just press enter. Um, oh, goodness. I pressed it too many times. Sorry, I'm going to have to start that again. Second, calculate number four. A number on the left, press enter. A number on the right would be like four is on the right of the maximum. And it has two little dotted lines there, and it's saying, do you want me to guess between these? Just press enter again, and it is going to take, and it's going to go and find that. Here you can see the maximum point happens to be when the y value is 1.3 repeating. So you could do it that way as well. Um, I suspect that if you have a calculator, you might choose that option, but you should pre be prepared, especially next year in calculus, you should be prepared to do it either way. Next one, a ball is thrown directly upward from an initial height of 50 feet. What that tells me right now with an initial height, that means it's crossing the y-axis at 50 feet. Initial value, you might remember before, was the y-intercept. And initial height here is the same thing at 50 feet. If the height in feet of the ball after t seconds is given by this, Find the maximum height reached by the ball. All right, so right here I see that this A value is negative. That means it's going to open down. I also know that it's starting here at 50. So here's what's really going to happen with this. This is T for time for the x-axis. This part of the graph that comes down over here is not real life. You can't have negative time. Just like anything down here, you can't have negative height. So here we have, with this right here, um, a parabola opening down. Now, we can do a couple of things. The first thing is, we could take and we could graph this on our calculator. This one here does pose a few more questions than the last one. When I put negative 16x squared plus 40x and then plus 50 in here, and when I press to graph it, I am not going to see a good chunk of it because remember this graph only goes to 10 right now and yet this frog is, is jumping from a height of 50 feet. So my window for this would need to go much higher. So that's my y max. If it's starting at 50, maybe I need to put it to 100 or something like that. I like to be kind of drastic as I pick my numbers. So then from there, if I go by 10s and it's going to go up to 100, I can see where the frog is at 50 feet, and it doesn't quite jump up to 50 feet. I always like to pick a, big, pick a bigger number so that I don't have to go back and pick it again and again and again. But I can, at this point, find the maximum height reached, again, by taking second trace, going to maximum, number four. The um, little blinker is to the left of it now, so I'm just going to press enter. A number to the right of it, it looks like maybe 3 is to the right, so I'm going to just press the number 3. And then just press Enter, and it will tell me what the maximum height there is. Okay, so that's if you're permitted to use a calculator and you don't have to show any work. All right, what that's saying for this right here is this is happening at 1.25, oops, 75. It means the maximum, it takes 1.25, uh, what is this in, seconds, to reach 75 feet. That's what that's referring to. Now, if this here is 1.25,
then the distance over to this x-intercept is the same as the distance over to this x-intercept. Remember, it is halfway in between right there. So sometimes problems will give you one x-intercept and you have to find the other. All you have to do is add whatever number to that number that's in the middle or subtract. Now, if you are asked to find the x-intercept of this right here, here is a way that you can do it. Here's a little formula called negative b over 2a. Remember in this problem, a is negative 16, b is 40, and c is 50. If you take the opposite of b, which is negative 40, over 2 times a, which is negative 32, 8 goes into both of these numbers. 8 goes into um, negative 40, and let's do the negatives cancel with each other, 5 times, and 8 goes into 32 4 times, which is 1.25. So you can, if you don't have a calculator, or if you have to show algebraically how you get it, this is the formula. So make sure you have that in your notes. Next, a toy rocket is launched um, on the top of a 150-foot cliff. What that tells me right now is it's up here at 150 feet, and it's going to come up and go down like that. Um, unless it's just dropped straight down. So if the height and feet of the rocket t seconds after liftoff is given by this equation, find the maximum height of the rocket and the time it reaches to, make, to um, reach its maximum height. So let's do it algebraically this time. A is negative 16, B is 288, and C is 150. If we use our x equals negative b over 2a, we have negative 288 over 2 times negative 16, which is negative 32. And then from there, I might go to my calculator and say, what's 288 divided by 32? Because I see the negatives will cancel. And I get 9. What that's saying is this high point is when the time is 9. And I always have to go back and read the problem. Did it tell us? seconds. Here we have feet and seconds. So it's always given up there. After nine seconds, it will reach its maximum height. But then from there to find the maximum height, I have to find the y value. So I can take and plug the x value into the equation. And of course, those are pretty big numbers, so I would expect that you would go to your calculator. Negative 16 times 81, and then plus 288 times 9, and then plus 150. And it comes down to 1,446. So this here is 1,446 feet. So it takes 9 seconds to get 1,446 feet up in the air. Okay. Again, you could take, you could put that in your calculator. But when you start messing with big numbers like this, that's where many times you guys don't necessarily feel real comfortable on the calculator. All right, next one. A farmer decides to build a fence to enclose a rectangular field in which he will plant a crop. He has 800 feet of fence to use, and his goal is to maximize the area of the field. The word maximize is saying you're going to find the maximum. What is the width of the field if the length of the field is 150 feet? So we have two separate problems here. Here's the first one. This, by the way, was one of the PC questions. Um, it says if the width is 150 feet, uh, this one here, we're going to use all four sides. That means this is 150 feet. And we started with 800. So these here, we'll call these x. What I could do is I could say, if I add them up, 2x plus 300, that's 150 plus 150, equals the 800. Subtract 300 from each side, and then divide by 2, and it would give us what this side and this side actually are. Okay? It says, what is the width of the field if the length of the field is 150 feet? 
So the width of the field, that means, would be 250 feet. A farmer decides to build a fence to enclose a rectangular field. I was just checking because some of them, they don't include one side of the fence right there. Then it says, what is the width of the field if the length of the field is 330 feet? All right, so we're going to do the same thing. This is 330.03. And this is 330.03. .03. Here's x, here's x. So we have 2x uh, plus 660.06 um, equals 800. And when I subtract 666.06 .06 from each of those, 800 minus 666.06. .06, and we get 133.94 and divide both sides by 2. Divide it by 2. And we get 66.97 feet. So that's what this answer would be, 66.97 feet. That's kind of a strange way to do it. I think there, you know, whoever chose this problem for you, um, was just saying, hey, it really doesn't matter if it's a whole number or not. You're still going to use the same thing. Then it says, define a function k that determines the length of the fence, the length of the fence in terms of the fence's width, which they're calling w, given the total amount of fence is 800 feet. All right, so with that right there, they're saying to find something known as K of W. If you can see the K, you can see the W right here. All right, so right here we have our X is our W. Um, so what we could do is we could say the width is W. Where's the length? Did they give us that? Determines the length of the fence. Oh, that is the length of the fence. So here they're asking us, this here is our x. This is our length right here. They're asking us to take these equations and in place of this, put a w. Okay, so imagine if we had that and then we solved for this over here. So um, for that right there, what I did is I subtracted these from both sides trying to think of how to show you using that k of w. I'm going to use the w and, and the in, in that right there. I'm going to say the length, 2 times the length, plus the width, plus 2 times the width, I should say, equals 800. Subtract the width from both sides. The length comes out to 800 divided by 2 minus 2w divided by 2, which is 400 minus w, but of course they want us to call it k of w instead. So this formula would be k of w equals 400 minus the width. Okay, this is which of the following represents the area? Area is the length times the width on this right here. So if they're asking you to have the length, the, w, the width to be W, and for the length to be um, K of W. Let's do that. It says, find the area. Well, the area is the length times the width. So here you have it, this guy here, W times K of W. Then it says, if the farmer has 250 feet of fencing to create a rectangular pen, Define a function f that expresses the area of the field measured in square feet as a function of the width of the side of the field, w. All right, so let's take a look at it again. If we have ourselves a pen and we have um, define a function f that expresses the area, so our width is going to be here. This is going to be f of w for our, our um, length. Our area is going to be f of w times w. But also don't forget that all of these total, two w's plus two f of w's, two lengths plus two widths, has to equal the 250 feet. If you divide both sides by two, you'd get w plus f of w equals 125. And in place of f of w, you could take 
subtract this from both sides, f of w is the same as 125 minus w. I could take and plug it in there. It'd be 125 minus w times w. Or, distributing that, 125w minus w squared. Getting you right to a parabola. So it says, if the farmer has 250 feet of fence to create a rectangular fit pen, define a function f that expresses the area of the field. Um, so I guess they wanted us to call that f right there in terms of the width. So we could say, I guess this is going to be our area, f of w is 125w minus w squared for that. Here they didn't want f of w, I messed up there. They didn't, I reread that wrong. In place of all of those f of w's, I'm just going to replace them with a length. Length, length times width, two times the length, get the length, like that. Okay, next, how are you at multiplying things like this together? Like x plus 5 squared, this is known as a perfect square. Just like if you have 5 squared, it's 25, it means 5 times 5. But written this way means it is a perfect square. So the first three are written as perfect squares right now. But what you know is it means x plus 5 times x plus 5. But can you multiply it out without writing that? So like when you write it this way, you know you have to FOIL. First times first, x squared. Outside, plus 5x. Inside, plus 5x. Last, plus 25. But these middle terms combine together, so you get a 10x plus 25. Here's what I'd like for you to know. You could take and square the first term, you get that. Square the last term, you get that. Multiply these together, and then multiply it by 2, you get that. So you don't have to write these out every time. So like this one here, I could square it quickly by squaring the first, squaring the last, multiplying these two, two together, and multiplying by 2. See how much work that saves you? Do it again. Square the first, square the last. Multiply together and multiply by 2. Now this one we're going to do it the same way and in the end we're going to add a 3 to it. So here, square the first, square the last. Multiply together and multiply by 2. But then you still have the plus 3 to add to the end which is x squared minus 4x plus 7. The point that we are going to get to with this is if you can put it into this form, then you can take these two numbers, the opposite of the first number and the same as the second number, and it actually gives you what the vertex is, the maximum, the minimum, of the actual parabola. So if something is not currently written in this form, we want to know how to write it in that form. So this is known as the vertex form of a parabola. It's known as, and I have two of them up here, y equals x minus h squared plus k, where there's only a 1 in front of your x terms in the original problem, and then a x minus h plus k. Notice it's the opposite of this one, but the same as this one right here. So if you have a coefficient in front, you're going to use the second method. If you, if you don't, if you just have a 1, you're going to use the first method. All right, so we might want to take some time to pause right now and multiply, or write these steps down so that you have them. These are the steps that I'm going to be using, okay? We're using a process called completing the square. And what we're going to do is we're going to take an equation and change it into vertex form, all right? In other words, we're going to take something like, let me find one, that maybe I have here. Maybe, maybe I have here. I don't know if I have any. Okay, I found one. Let's see. You are going to be taking x squared minus 4x plus 1, and you're going to re be writing it in this vertex form that looks like this. So this here is the process to do it. 
when it happens to be in this form, it means I know the vertex of the parabola happens to be 2, negative 3. When it's in this form, I don't know that. And so it's, it happens to be a form that is very helpful in different situations. So the first thing you're going to do, looking at this equation right here, you're going to separate the x terms from the numbers with a plus blank, and then you're going to have a minus blank after the number. So this means this, x squared minus 4x plus blank, and then plus 1 minus blank. So you're going to put a plus blank physically and then a minus blank at the end. Step two, you're going to factor out an A value if there is one. Well, for this first problem, it's just a one, so there's not one. We're going to leave it like that. Step three, I'm going to put parentheses squared with an X on the next line. Then I'm going to fill the parentheses with half of the coefficient of the value of X. So here's the value of X. I'm going to take half of that number right there. Half of negative 4 is negative 2, and that's what I'm going to fill in that parenthesis with. That's what step 4 looks like. Step 5, we're going to square this number from step 4 and place it in the blank on the line above it. So if I take negative 2 right here and I square it and fill in that blank, negative 2 squared is positive 4. And then I'm going to put it over here where the minus 4 is as well. That's what um, step six is. Multiply this value by the A that was factored out and place it in the blank above the blank. Oh, that, this one here I don't need because I didn't have a coefficient. And then from here I'm going to combine the numbers at the end, minus three. So do you see how we just took that and we rewrote it in that form? And then many times the question then becomes, what is the vertex of this? Okay, so that's what I'd like to do is go through several of these until you get the hang of it. The first time you tend to see these, they look confusing. After you see the second one, you might feel like, oh, okay, I see, it's, it looks the same. And then by the time you get to the third one, you're feeling pretty good. But then of course, I'm gonna switch things up on you and make sure that I give you one that has a number other than just a one right there. So then again, it's gonna seem confusing get a little bit easier, and then you'll probably feel like maybe at that point you can do something with it. So here we have, and we're not going to do all of these. Again, I just threw some examples up here. It says write this in vertex form. All right. So let's take, for example, number one. Okay. X squared minus 14X plus 48. We're going to write it in vertex form. So step one is to take and separate the terms that have x's with a plus blank from the term that doesn't. So these have x's, this guy doesn't. And then I end with a minus blank as well. Next, I put a parenthesis with a squared and an x under it. The step after that, I'm going to take half of this number right here and write it in the blank right below it, negative 7. Next, I'm going to square that number to fill that blank. Negative 7 squared is positive 49. I'm going to put a 49 in this blank as well. So these blanks are matching. Whatever you put in one, you're going to put in the other. And then from here, 48 minus 49 is negative 1. This here is now in vertex form, and it's the same equation as that one. But what I'm able to tell from it is that the vertex of this particular parabola is the opposite of that, same as that, okay? Now just to make sure you believe me, I do want to take and graph it on the calculator so that you can see that I'm not really making something up here. Um, x squared minus 14x plus 48. I'm going to graph it. Actually, I'm going to press zoom 6 because I don't know where my graph was last time. can't remember. I think I changed something. And here you can see that that vertex is at the point 7, negative 1, okay? Again, if you really wanted to check and not just eyeball it, you could press second calculate. You could go to minimum, since it's a minimum this time, that's number 3. Pick a number to the left, like 4. Pick a number to the right, like maybe 10. Press enter, and it goes and it finds 7, negative 1. So let's talk about this right here, how this is not saying 7. It's saying 
Okay, that rounds to seven. Your calculator is totally programmed with different algorithms in order to, you know, do the work more quickly. Um, and because of that, sometimes some numbers get rounded along the way, and so we end up with numbers like that. If you ever see something like that, give the nearest whole number to it. That's exactly what it means, okay? All right, next one I want to do, I want to do, let's do number 2, x squared minus 4x minus 21. Because by the time you get to this one, you're going to start maybe kind of guessing how to do it on your own. You're going to separate the x's from the extra numbers with a plus blank. Then the number, then a minus blank. You put the parenthesis under it with a square. Put an X inside. Next, you're going to take half of this number to fill in this parenthesis. You're going to square it to come back up here. And then you're going to put the same number over here. These two numbers combine together to give you negative 25. So if the problem then asks you for the vertex, it is the opposite of this. Sorry, my pen uh, touched down. And the same as this. And there's your vertex. Okay, so I think that's enough of these that have a coefficient of 1. But now let's do one that doesn't have a coefficient of 1. Like, let's do number 11, 4x squared minus 8x minus 21. 4x squared minus 8x, and then I cannot remember if it was minus 21 or plus 21. Let's double check. Minus 21. Okay, we were okay there. All right. So this is number, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Number 11. All right. So for this one here, it starts out the same, separating the x's from the numbers. So we have 4x squared minus 8x plus blank and then minus 21, minus blank. All right, so that part there, nothing different. Here's where something's different. If you have a number in front of the squared term, then you are going to factor it out in front. And not only are you going to factor it from the 4, but also from the 8. So that if you distributed it back, you would get the line above it. I am going to pull the plus blank down We'll take care of distributing the 4 to that in a little bit. Now, under this, I am going to put the parenthesis with the square. The 4 is also going to come down in front of it. I take half of negative 2, which is negative 1. I square it to fill the blank. So you're going to feel that that is the same. Now, here is another new step. To fill the blank up here above that, I have to take the 4 and distribute it. Okay? And then that goes here as well. I combine these together to get negative 25. So for this one here, it has a vertex of opposite of that, same as that. So you can see a lot of the work is done the same, but there is that additional step in there. Okay, so that was the first one. So that one, of course, is going to seem a little bit confusing. But now let's go grab another one. Let's do um, number 8 right there looks good. 3x squared plus 20x minus 63. 3x squared minus 20x plus 63. I think it was number 8, but I do need to check that. Minus 20x plus 63. Oh, plus 20x minus 63. Let's change that around there. This here is a minus, and this is a plus. All right, so just like before, we're going to separate the x's from the numbers. 3x squared plus 20x plus blank minus 63 minus blank. Now, for this one here, I need to factor a 3 out front. And so I happen to choose one that has fractions. So that does definitely, you know, make it a little more difficult. When I take this term divided by um, 3, I get an x squared. When I take 20x divided by 3, I get 20 thirds x. I'm just going to write it as a fraction. All right, next we have our parenthesis with a square that comes down. 
Now watch this one here closely because you can make this hard or you can make this easy. If you want to take half of a fraction, you just take the fraction and you multiply it by a half. With this, it comes out to be 26 or the two and this end up reducing to give you 10 thirds. All right, now from here, we are going to square this to fill the blank above. Square the top, square the bottom. Don't try to square 10 thirds as like three and one third squared kind of thing. Just square the top and square the bottom. Keep them as fractions. It's actually easier. Next, I will distribute this to fill the blank above it. Well, 3 times 100 over 9. The 3 and the 9 actually reduce to give you 100 thirds. So now I'm stuck with this. How do I combine those? Well, I would need a common denominator. This currently has a 1 as a denominator. If I multi multiply the numerator by 3, I get 189 thirds minus 100 thirds, which is minus 289 thirds. So here it is. You can get through it with fractions. It is more difficult. However, and, and that could happen even on the other type as well, but um, for this right here, the vertex would actually be negative 10 thirds and negative 289 thirds. You could, of course, change those like, you know, negative 3 and a third and uh, negative 91, no, 99 and so many thirds, you know, whatever that comes out to. All right, let's do another one that doesn't have fractions so that you don't, I don't leave you with a bad taste in your mouth right here. Um, let's do, hmm, where's a good one? Let's do number 16 with that negative right there. That's a good one. Um, 7 minus 12x minus 4x squared. 7 minus 12x minus 4x squared. Okay. First thing I would um, just urge you on here is to kind of flip things around. Rewrite it as negative 4x squared minus 12x and then plus 7. That's going to give it to you a little bit easier. It is easier to have it with the squared term first. Next, you're going to separate negative 4x squared minus 12x plus blank and then plus 7 minus blank. Next, you're going to take whatever coefficient you have with the x squared, and you are going to factor it out. That gives you x squared, and then negative 12 divided by negative 4 is positive 3x, and then plus blank. This one will have fractions, but not quite as bad as the other one. From here, you write the parentheses with the squared. Make sure you have the negative 4 in the front. Take half of this value, so that's plus 3 halves. And then when you square it to fill the blank, square the top, square the bottom. Then when you distribute the negative 4 to it, you get a negative 9. You put a negative 9 over here as well. Notice two negatives here make it 7 plus 9 for a plus 16. So the vertex for this one is negative 3 halves and positive 16. All right. Um, let me just make one up. I, I, I just don't want to leave you with one with a fraction. So I'll put extra here. Extra, extra. Read all about it, right? Let's do, um, let's do 5x squared plus 10x um, minus 7, something like that. Um, from here, 5x squared plus 10x plus blank. Minus 7 minus blank. I need to factor a 5 out, giving me x squared plus 2x plus blank. And then I write my parentheses below it, taking half of that number being plus 1, squaring it to fill the blank, distributing the 5 to fill the blank above it. So these two here give me minus 12. And that means my vertex is negative 1, positive 1. Well. All right, so I think that's enough for this lesson. That's quite a few uh, new little things there. 
Um, before the next class or before the next video that you watch, you should complete homework 34, which is M5I4. Also, you should complete homework 35, which is labeled completing the square. That's what that last slide was. And there's also a homework called mini exam review for systems and quadra or quadratics. Uh, before you watch the next video, you should complete the PC assignment 25 over M5I3. Notice module 5 we do in kind of a crazy order here, but it's the order that's suggested from main campus. All right, I hope you all are staying healthy.